front of you, this room has been specially set up that there's a microphone on every table. The reason being is that we have uh, two, uh, this is a, a discussion on virtual goods, and it's quite appropriate that we have two virtual speakers. <laughs> One, Tony Clayton from the UK, and joining us shortly will be uh, Peter Jeong from Hong Kong. Now, I'm going to try and invert some of the ordering because um, the, f the sessions that I've seen thus far are typically just panel presentations which take up most of the, the meeting and then a little bit of discussion uh, at the end. So what I would like to do is really turn the floor over to you after a little bit of introduction because this is actually quite a, 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 a expansive topic and we need to be realistic what we can achieve in an hour and a half. So can I see if there's any, are there any um, bankers in the room? We have one banker in the room. Uh, we have any accountants in the room? Any lawyers in the room? We've got f five lawyers, six, seven lawyers in the room. Any people who do trade policy, negotiate trade policy? Uh, Nick, one person in the room. Uh, any engineering people, te technical staff? Okay. So this is going to be a very interesting uh, dialogue. Yep, go ahead. Um, and so let's begin. How do I Left and right, okay. Hello, Pinda, can you see me? Oh, very good. This is Peter Jung joining from Hong Kong. Hello, hello everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We've just gone through the room and we have lawyers, uh, uh, accountants, technical people, engineers. Economists, yes. any economists? We have one economist, I know that. Is Tony listening? <laughs> He's an economist. Ah, there you go. Thank you. Oh, yes, and two economists, in fact. So, look, the theme here is building bridges of the whole IGF. And so what we're trying to do here is build a bridge across three different ecosystems. The first ecosystems are those who, like Nick, are involved in the international trade ecosystem. The second ecosystem are those of you who are bankers here who are a part of the international financial ecosystem. And the traditional regular IGF um, are participants in the IG Internet Governance Ecosystem. Now, the way we're going to try and build these bridges is by looking at fundamental challenges and fundamental opportunities in this space of virtual goods. Now, the fundamental challenges um, has actually, that discussion has already occurred. It occurred at the Asia-Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum, where we talked about the ban of monetization of virtual goods that occurred last year in Japan and in Korea. And this was the ban of monetization of virtual goods inside these game economies where the, the number of players uh, are in the multiple millions. In other words, that the economies, these virtual economies using virtual currencies for virtual goods, uh, in terms of size, may be largely larger than some nation states in terms of participants. And the way we addressed that was, again, through the multi-stakeholder approach. We had an internet activist, Jayon Kim. We had um, the largest, uh, I think, uh, game and media f firm in South Korea that has uh, famous for its search engine and games. Uh, that was Kim Jong-il. We also had a presiding judge because some of the issues that we raised were social. For example, uh, uh, the connotations of monetization of goods in association with gambling. And he was also the co-public lead of CC uh, Korea. And we had the senior vice president of um, Korea's largest telecom company, which is actually happens to be very active in the trading of virtual goods, uh, especially with China. And Adam Peek uh, was the moderator. So if you're interested in what are the challenges, that, that whole session description, all the, uh, all the presentation and the video is online. So if we've dealt with the fo following uh, fundamental challenges, again, that was um, input into today's process, today's IGF, and that is really to talking about the fundamental opportunities. So we've looked at the downside. Now we're today, the today's objective is to look at the fundamental opportunities, and this is stage two of a three-stage process. The, three sta the third stage is back in, in Bali in December, there will be the WTO meeting, ministers meeting, and I think, Nick, you'll be participating in that. So this has been a one, two, three um, stage process. And the way that we designed it was to look at you know, what technologies are in the horizon that will provide some degree of tra transformation, transformative technologies, uh, some would argue disruption. 
And in preparing for today, I basically thought, well, there are basically two. One involves 3D laser scanning of objects, of perhaps even building size. The second is the 3D printing of those same objects. So if you think about that, if you can scan a 3D object and then print it out, if I scan it in Hong Kong and, and, and send that 3D printer file to you in Argentina and you print that out, um, that's a whole new different dynamic. Uh, as I say in Hong Kong, that has the potential for taking piracy literally into a whole new dimension, the third dimension. The second transformative technology that I see is routing money on the Internet. The Internet being used as a, the network to route money. And so that's the emergence over the, very shortly of the 2000, uh, starting next year and uh, ideally finishing in 2017, the W3C web payment standard. You heard about the W3C yesterday, the Internet Standards Body for the Web, and we're fortunate to have Manu Sporny, who's the working group chair of that transformative technology. So not just technologies, let's look at transformative business models. And that's what our, our, our um, the goal here is very simply to enable business models to make it really easy to, to legally license and pay for intellectual property. We're beginning to see that already in terms of uh, iTunes models and subscription models. And to share with uh, us their experience, uh, we have Peter Jung, who is the director of intellectual property of the Hong Kong Intellectual Property Department. He is also the principal nego negotiator for Hong Kong China in the WTO uh, TRIPS uh, discussions, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. Now, together with that, we have to look at how we're going to measure progress. Right? We have one economist in the room. We have one remotely. That's Tony Clayton, the chief economist of the UK Intellectual Property Office. So not just transformative business models that are being developed in Hong Kong, such as IP trading platforms. We have four but also in the UK in terms of aspects like digital copyright exchange. And that leads to transformative policy, not just new GTLDs, which are the traditional trademark space, but also copyright policy reform. And we have Jeanette, who here is an expert on this, who will add her views later. So what is a fundamental question that we can frame the opportunity before us in the, an hour or so that we have? Um, this has been, the way I try to frame it is really quite simply as thus. If the last 200 years of global trade was defined by wars over physical resources and trade over physical goods, my question is, will the next 200 years of global trade be defined by wars over virtual resources and trade over virtual goods? So if that's the question, then if it's going to be trade over virtual goods, then how are we going to do that? And is there anything that we can, in terms of... Um, of uh, strategies, does the strategy change? Does the strategy change from traditional divide and conquer strategies used over the last 200 years or strategies that connect and liberate, which have been used in the internet era in the last 20 years? So to kick that off, I would like to turn to uh, Peter Jung, who is the first speaker. Uh, Peter, are you ready? Can you hear us, Peter? Uh, I think we may have lost him. Oh, okay. Can you hear? Now, can we can we can we bring up his video on terms of WebEx uh, on this screen? I think what I need to do is log on from this screen. Is that right? Can you display? the WebEx video conference on the large screen. Hello, oh, so Hello Peter. Yep. Okay. okay, can I go on? Uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, can you see my PowerPoint slides? We're bringing up the slides, but we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. All right. Now, while waiting for the uh, PowerPoint slides, I, I should like to thank uh, Tinda for, uh, for having me in this process and should and to thank uh, IGF for, uh, for suggesting this wonderful program. And uh, I'm now having a new experience to, to, to be a remote presenter. And uh, what I'll be talking about uh, is a subject called uh, trading of intangible, tangent, uh, trading of internet uh, goods, uh, virtual goods. 
So uh, I, I think that many of you must be familiarized with some very explicit well trends. Uh, say, a feminization, singularization, uh, urbanization, and also globalization. Now, all what I'll be talking about is a different uh, trend, a latent but insignificant trend. Uh, can I go to a power, uh, my PowerPoint slide number one? Can you see the slide about the outline? Still arranging, just can, can you see? Yeah, we're just still bringing it up, but just please carry on. Uh, okay. The, the, uh, my, for my uh, PowerPoint slide number two, uh, I, I highlight the outline. I shall be talking about the context, the challenges and the solutions, uh, the role of Hong Kong, China in this exciting process, uh, some sharing of the outlook to draw some conclusions as well as some next steps for everyone to consider. Okay, uh, so now that I can, I can now see uh, my PowerPoint slides and then I have just covered uh, uh, slide number two. Now can I go to slide number three? And that is about the well track. Yeah. Slide number three, please. Yes, thank you. Now, uh, I, 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 I called on a, a, a word called intellectual propertization. Uh, I think this is a latent but important world trend. Uh, there is a research company uh, which has done a survey of the value components of the Standard Poor 500 companies. Uh, one result uh, that was discovered was that, was this. Over 80% of the value components of the standard and core 500 companies are rest in intangibles. Uh, it is the intangibles, these virtual goods, that give these big enterprises the competitive edge uh, uh, to, to drive the business. So I, I think the, uh, the economy right now is not just a knowledge economy, but also a, a creative and innovative in economy, and more importantly, the economy is intellectual property driven. Now, turning to slide number four, I, you see some statistics. Now, these statistics are, are released by uh, the United Nations uh, International uh, Institution called the World Intellectual Property Organization. Now, this uh, WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, released some statistics concerning the licensing of intellectual property uh, for profit. You will see from the bar charts that in, uh, in the year 1970, the, current, uh, the total amount of uh, intellectual property licensing for profit in terms of royalties in, uh, in U.S. billions uh, was just 2.8 uh, billion U.S. And then 20 years later in 1990, it has risen about 10 times. And then in 2009, you can see the figure nearly another 10 times. Now it's 2013. So you see the sky is the limit. I, can, I, I would like to cite some more tangible examples in my slide number five. And that is about the value of branded enterprises. Uh, these are the, uh, uh, the most valuable uh, branded enterprises uh, done by uh, various agencies. And I should like to talk very briefly about them the, the green one on the left-hand side, but you see that if you want to uh, 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 buy Apple, for example, uh, uh, then you might have to pay, in terms of U.S. millions, 98316, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, uh, Apple is, of course, is a brand enterprises. Uh, I think one of its value addedness is uh, not much in relation to technology, but, few, but in humanizing technology uh, and setting up standard, you know, and that, way, that, would, that is changing the way of life of many, many people. Now, on number, uh, at number two is Google. Uh, Google is, uh, is, is having a very large, a large market share in terms of the digital services market. Uh, it is also accumulating accumulating some intellectual property portfolios because it needs the content that will support its digital services. At number three is Coca-Cola, which used to be number one. 
Hong Kong Love Color has been riding on certain intangible assets, namely the trade secret of its Coca Cola formula. For IBM, IBM had changed its uh, business model over 20 years ago, from manufacturing of hardware to the provision of intellectual property related uh, services. Uh, at number five is Microsoft. In addition to the name, Microsoft is generating uh, revenue streams from the, the copyright in its copyright computer programs. At number six is General Electric. Now, it used to carry the name Edison too, but it doesn't need Edison anymore. Uh, G is pretty innovative. It is uh, an important player in the global value chain. At number seven is McDonald's. Okay, it's a big brand name, Samsung is doing very well, uh, it's being pretty innovative. Intel has been riding on, uh, on, on royalties of its chips, layout design, uh, topographies of integrated circuits. And number 10 is Toyota, it's a Toyota way of management. It also generates a lot of uh, uh, innovative uh, uh, stuff. Now, now turning to uh, uh, slide number six, about the business challenge, uh, how the question is how to drive business growth and to enhance business competitiveness, especially for the SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprise, which uh, have been operational at the global production chain. Now, uh, my, the suggest my solution at slide number seven is this. I would, uh, call, I would call upon all the stakeholders, especially medium and, and, uh, medium and medium-sized enterprises, to develop an intellectual property business strategy so that they can join the global value chain as distinct from the global production chain. Now, it, it is like this. You can see the timeline and all uh, the horizontal timeline and also the vertical uh, money line. And if we are living in a knowledge economy, in order to do better, I think it's better for us to do some knowledge management. Now, in the course, course of doing that, you have to capture the knowledge try to turn the, uh, the tacit knowledge in our head and make that explicit. We will have, try to establish a database uh, to maintain, to do the knowledge management, so, that, so as to enable people to assess it and more importantly, to use it. Now, that is uh, knowledge management in very simple terms. Uh, but, but if knowledge is known by everybody, which is general, is not value added. So in a creative or innovative economy, if you want to meet, add more value, you have to exercise innovation management. That is to say, if, in order to be creative and innovative, you have to analyze the creative and technological landscape so that you can predict change, predict the market, your right customers. These are very important uh, innovation strategy. And more importantly, at the end of the day, as you have heard from uh, Pinder's in, introductory remarks, would that the market to be shared by among the competitors, the world competitors, I think it's not so much on innovation or marketing or en entrepreneurship. At the end of the day, which enterprise would have the market share would depend on the kind of intellectual property portfolio, the kind of virtual goods that they have. Now, take, take Apple and Samsung, Samsung as an example. Now, they litigate uh, 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 with each other in a number of cases, in a number of jurisdictions. Now, at the end of the day, which company will have the market share will depend on whether the company's intellectual property or virtual goods will be upheld by the court of that particular jurisdiction. So uh, this is the big picture. I think it is an important one, and I will uh, invite stakeholders to exercise better knowledge management, innovation management, and more particularly, to do intellectual property management. Uh, this would include, for example, aggregating intellectual property. Because one piece of virtual goods may not be valuable enough. But if you try to aggregate it into, like, the, uh, into something that would meet the, uh, the market, then it would carry weight and would be, can be used as a defensive or offensive weapon in, uh, in, a, uh, yes, in the modern day of, uh, of uh, economic warfare. Now, turning to uh, slide number eight, about the second uh, business challenge that I have identified, and that is how to turn creative and innovative ideas into action. Now, how to resolve that? 
uh, is you can be you, you can see that in in slide number nine. In my view, to resolve the challenge, one has to practice uh, entrepreneurship, and that is to say, you have to embrace risk, you have to be very resourceful, and you have to believe in what you believe, and therefore you can live your dream and buy your business up. Now, you can see uh, these photos are uh, taken by me. Uh, I, I try to assimilate the SMEs, the small and medium sized enterprise, as the runners in this marathon race. They are, uh, for the big players, they are already running in, in, the, in the front. For the small players, they are forever player followers. The way for them to to transform and uplift themselves require a special strategy, a special differentiating factor. And and some of which I have identified earlier is knowledge management, innovation management, and intellectual property management. You have to find the differentiating factor and that, are, and that is the strength of you or your enterprise. We try to do do something that people say that you can do or you can never succeed. The, uh, the next challenge I identify is uh, in slide number 10, is the how to enhance e-commerce, particularly in the digital uh, uh, economy. Now in e-commerce, most of the time we are buying intangibles through digital service platform. But have we thought about, in fact, uh, buy intellectual property, virtual goods, all right, in, in some intangible that assets that can be digitalized and can be distributed over the internet uh, instantaneously. Now, this, there is a, a huge potential for the e-commerce of, of digital or uh, virtual goods. Uh, so, uh, and this has been, uh, uh, next slide please, in the slide number 11, uh, the research solution to enhance e-commerce, in, in my view, could, could, be, uh, could begin with the trading of uh, certain virtual goods like copyright works. Uh, these are the literary artistic uh, works which can, are manifesting themselves in terms of uh, e-books, uh, e photos, audio visuals, music, uh, music, films, films. And uh, also certain designs, um, uh, which have I appeal, and can be applied industrially, can also be digitalized. And with the modern day 3D printing, but I think this, uh, this digital virtual goods um, have become more tradable. Uh, similarly, uh, you, you need a brand, a mark, to identify yourself, and also to distinguish yourself from your competitors and you would need a trade name, a domain name to facilitate your potential customers, the world customers to reach out to your goods and services. But even this, uh, this, uh, uh, this intellectual property, this, this virtual goods, they can be trade uh, by themselves. Now, uh, this may sound um, unfamiliar, but if you take Think about what, what do we trade. Basically, <clears throat> we trade in goods and services, just like a tie. Even in a tie, there is a trademark. Here is the design of the tie. All right. Now, these virtual and valuable stuff can be traded via the internet. The next uh, challenge, and the last one I identified uh, in uh, slide number 12, is about how to get low cost of entry and high rate of return. Uh, this is what everybody, uh, especially medium, small and medium sized enterprise would like to have. But the best solution to that is in the next slide, in slide number 13. This is about the intellectual property trading that uh, um, uh, Pinder has alluded to. Now, the co basically, the concept and structure of international intellectual property trading or virtual goods is this. There are basically three institutions. In the yellow column, about this step. Now, there are many people uh, or enterprises that have got intangibles, variable virtual goods, 
but they are not exploiting them, like trade secrets, copyright work designs, uh, and there are other intellectual properties like chips laid out, the mass work, inventive patterns, time varieties, train mark, train names, or naming, etc. They, they, they have the rights, but they are not exploiting them. Some of them, that, some of these may not be their time to. But on, on the blue, on the, in the blue, uh, column, there is a requesting side. Supposing you are an SME, a small and medium sized enterprise. You don't have the money, you don't have the resources, you don't have the people, and then all, what you want is a quick, uh, return on your investment. So you don't have the time to invest on something creative or innovation, or, or maybe you don't bother with the application or the acquisition or any uh, intellectual property or virtual, or virtual goods. So you may simply try to access to this web-based IP trading or virtual goods trading platforms to request what you want. What kind of trade secret, say, in terms of formula uh, that you want? Or what kind of copyright works or virtual goods? What I like photos or soundtracks or films that you want? Or the kind of design that you would like to, to, uh, as to, to make your industrial products with chips laid out, inventive patterns, fun varieties, trade marketing, trade names, or dominion, etc. Uh, somebody can, uh, can, you can request for that. And, and maybe there is a disconnect between the potential seller and the potential buyer. Now, in between uh, this, uh, uh, the concept of uh, intellectual property trading is that there is a, uh, there are intermediaries. These, are, these may include people who would do the consulting, the brokerage, do, doing the due diligence, for example, to check the proprietorship or technological competence or the fitness for use of certain virtual goods. And also somebody would have to do the valuation about how much one pay or how much it is sold. And also there could be people who would help with the financing, uh, the pledging, and then some would help out with the legal documentation, translation, and in case of dispute, what to do. So uh, this is the concept and structure of international intellectual property trading. This is open, non-discriminatory. Everyone uh, should be able to use it. Now, so far, so uh, it, is the, it is not one-to-one. -one. It's, not, it's not only one-to-one -one or one-to-many. It's many-to-one-many, -many, flat based interactive dynamic. And at the next slide, you will see that uh, uh, um, Hong Kong has the uh, unique structural capital uh, to do this. Uh, this is basically because uh, Hong Kong uh, abide by the rule of law, we mean what we say. Our tax system is simple and low, and then there is no foreign exchange control. Once a transaction is done, you can take the money out the next second. Hong Kong is bilingual, as you can see in this slide, it's in, in English and Chinese, also speak Cantonese. And more importantly, because of Hong Kong geopolitical status, it is the window of China. So for people who would like to do business with China, you can use the Hong Kong window. For mainland China to do to outreaching the world, they can also use a special administrative region of Hong Kong to help that out. Hello. So, Peter. So, uh, uh, the next slide, please. Peter, can you... Uh, and then in the next slide, you can see uh, there are... Peter, can we... Can in, we fact, just, in Hong Kong... Yeah, yes? We just, um, I, think, yes? I think we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, in the interest of time, could we just uh, perhaps come back to the slides later at a discussion? I see. Is that okay? I think this is this is covered a lot. Or perhaps just one more slide because the the in, this is the internet the uh, the internet dimension I think is in the next slide. Perhaps one more slide. Yes. Yeah. Oh, just one more slide. Okay, thank you. I can't see. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Now in Hong Kong, we, there are already uh, several of this uh, uh, private sector IP training platforms. Uh, uh, there are at least uh, four, and and the one is coming up. And then we, we have been uh, uh, marketing uh, the bu uh, business of intellectual property in, in Hong Kong in 2011 and 2012. And then uh, I should say that um, in, in, in 2011, there are 700 participants. And then in 2012, there are 1,400 uh, participants. Just imagine, you know, talking about the business of intellectual property. Uh, and these people are coming from 23 sections. 
So we'll be hosting, uh, together with the Hong Kong Trade and Development Council, uh, another Business and Intellectual Property Asia Forum in December 5th and 6th this year. And, uh, in, and furthermore, INTA, the International uh, Trademark Association, will hold its annual meeting in Hong Kong next year, and uh, in May, uh, from, uh, from May 10th to uh, May 14th. And it is expected there will be at least 8,000 to 10,000 10, uh, participants. Uh, the possibility to talk, you know, uh, to, uh, to trade virtual goods, particularly on trademarks, uh, is available in that particular forum. So that's a possibility. And uh, uh, very quickly, let me now turn to the next slide, and that's slide number 16. Uh, the Hong Kong government uh, is very supportive of this intellectual uh, property trading uh, platform initiative, and has established a working group on that, try to formulate the requisite strategies and measures uh, so as to provide the, uh, the policy environment to make the thing happen. And then what we need in the next, li next slide is this, to report the success okay. stories, right. to show that would be, uh, there are proofs of concept. Okay. Can that we is uh, slide 17. Very good. Let's just... And, uh, yes, and, and, and then very quickly, okay. the, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the short term, short term goal, uh, which should happen very soon. And okay. then the medium term is that we are working or, uh, very hard to establish international standards, like IT evaluation, for example, very so good. that it would uh, help to develop uh, the, uh, the environment. And then the long-term goal, the long-term goal, and that is in slide number 19, is to, for Hong Kong uh, and every interested persons and economies to nurture the intellectual property or the virtual ecosystem. So my conclusion is this, in, uh, in slide 20, what I'm trying to do, or what we are trying to do, is to identify the trend, the possibility of trading virtual goods. I hope everyone can recognize that and try to seize the opportunity to monetize on the trend timely. Um, and in the next, next slide. Last, we last have slide, to, last, uh, Peter, this is the yeah. la last slide, because this is the most important slide, I think, in your whole deck. What, could you talk about this slide a little bit, and then we'll just move to Tony, please? Yes. That is, uh, the future is now. Slide number 21, and that is uh, we have to plan to succeed, and then we need to, if we try to trade the virtual goods over the internet, we need to find ways to resolve the obstacles concerning internet ID. This is uh, how to pay, how to get the payments done, or, and then the possibility, uh, if everybody is using the, uh, the internet system, then should there be some kind of uh, fees so as to cover the administrative expenses and things like that. And uh, I, I, uh, these are some of the, uh, uh, the obstacles that uh, I think Tinder has identified and uh, I share this with you. Okay. Thank uh, in the next slide is... No, no, Peter, Peter, uh, Peter, Peter, Peter. I think we, we need to, in yeah. the interest of time, we would like to just hold it here. I think that issue on Internet ID payment and taxation, I think, is very key. Um, again, I said at the beginning, uh, perhaps you joined, we want to have a discussion because there's a lot of VIPs in the room. Okay. Uh, Please go ahead. Okay, I'll stop here. Yeah, diplomats and ambassadors and the rest. So um, let's uh, just have a dialogue. I think Tony, quickly. Uh, Tony, are you there? Can we switch to Tony? So Tony's a chief economist of the UK Intellectual Property Office. Um, you normally associate intellectual property with legal aspects and law, uh, lawyers. Uh, and Tony is the chief economist, and I think he'll talk a bit about uh, the UK experience, again, that involved copyright reform and very interestingly uh, looking at metrics. How do we measure this economy? How do we measure progress? So, Tony, if you're there, we'll can you hear me? Over to you. Yes, we can, can hear you loud and clear. Yep, Tony, just, sure. um, yep, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, keep it, uh, to, uh, keep yeah. it uh, clear. Thank you. You're, you're going to see a lot of commonality between the presentation I'm going to give and uh, the points made by Peter Chung. Um, and I think that the two presentations complement each other very well. Thanks very much for the invitation. Sorry I can't be there in person. I spent the last couple of days with the team at OECD in Paris working on knowledge-based capital, uh, where they're trying to do exactly these sorts of links between uh, the intellectual property system, the finance systems, and uh, the, the impact on uh, innovation and growth. Um, I'd like to just go through three brief topics. First, our take in the UK on intangibles and how intellectual property rights 
fits into the economy today and how things are changing. Secondly, what we're doing to change the intellectual property rights system in the UK to recognise the changing world. And that finally, I'd just like to touch on a report uh, which we've commissioned uh, about how intellectual property rights are used, or in many cases not used, in order to raise funding for investment in innovation uh, and in creativity. Well, that's a pretty important thing for all of us, I think, uh, including the internet businesses. So, slide three, please, um, shows what is in our definition of, of intangibles, the framework we use to think about this stuff for policy. Um, this is a framework which was developed in the States uh, for the US Federal Reserve about 10 years ago now, and which has been developed for a whole range of countries, including China. Um, but we effectively use it in the UK as one of our measures of innovation uh, to track what's going on in terms of business spending by firms in changing what they do. And it covers their investment in software, it's co covered in our case by copy copyright and creative works, covered by copyright, R&D, largely covered by patents, designs, covered by their own design rights, brands covered by trademarks, and then business organization and skills, um, the collective skills of, of, of a labor force sort of in a business, which are not really covered by any intellectual property rights at all. Um, but these are all spend by business for future growth and profits. So they are really investment, although they're not always captured as investment, either in the accounting systems of business or in the national accounts of countries. Can you, next slide, please. Slide four shows what has happened to this sort of spending in the UK and in most of Europe and in North America uh, over the last 20 years. And what we see is that intangible spend by business overtook spending on fixed assets sometime around 2000 in the UK. It was a bit earlier in, uh, in North America, and it's a bit later in some other countries, but this trend is happening absolutely everywhere. Um, it's not just a feature of developed economies, it's happening in China. Uh, it'll take a bit longer for the overtaking, I think, to happen, but uh, it's gonna happen in, in most of the economies that we work in. And on slide five, you can see where the big increases for us have happened. Um, and they have been in the investment in business organization within firms, in training people to uh, adapt to new types of business models, and in software and in design, and to a lesser extent in traditional R&D. I suspect that uh, in China there'll be a slightly different picture. Um, but these are radical changes in the investment mix of business. Uh, and they feed through into different ways of thinking about business, which Peter has, has referred to. But we can track this stuff by looking at what businesses spend. It's actually much harder to track it in terms of what they sell. Uh, the statistical systems are not yet really set up to do that. Um, and, there's, and there's more work to be done. If we look at slide six, uh, this helps us to understand a little bit about the dialogue that goes on between economists and lawyers in these areas. I was interested you had so many lawyers in the room. Uh, down the uh, left-hand side of this picture is how the economists think about this stuff. They think about it in terms of what firms spend. And across the top, you have it in the way lawyers think about it uh, in terms of the rights that the spend creates in patents, copyright, design, rights, trademarks, and then you've got trade secrets uh, and uh, restrictive contracts on employment. Um, and what we uh, concluded when we came to look at this uh, in, in a bit of detail three years ago for the first time was that the, 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 where the big money is is not necessarily in patents uh, for us, uh, but it's in some of the other rights, and particularly in design, uh, which covers a whole range of types of spend, um, and including in digital markets, increasingly you know, 
graphical user interfaces are part of design and they're covered by design rights as well as by software copyright. So this is increasingly uh, significant in thinking about the investment for the future. Uh, and if we go to slide seven, you'll see this is for the UK. This is a picture we're in the middle of redrawing because we didn't think we got it exactly right when we did this uh, a couple of years ago. We probably underestimated the importance of patents in R&D and also the patents in uh, engineering design. But as a rough estimate of how important this stuff is, intellectual property rights protect about 50% of UK intangible spending. That is £65 billion a year, UK, uh, which is as much as we spend on plant machinery, as much as our businesses spend on plant machinery. This is all private sector spend. It's not government. Um, and this feeds through to the, this is the next uh, chart, number eight, is the one that Peter showed. It's the Ocean Tomo study on the pr proportion of value accounted for by intangibles. Uh, not all of this is intellectual property rights. Some of it is you know, business capabilities. Some of it is uh, you know, workplace skills. But it's it's... You, when you see where the money is going in terms of investment, you can understand why the value turns up like this. And what's interesting about it, um, and it, it's, it's an important issue for policy, uh, both uh, in terms of intellectual property rights policy and in terms, I guess, in terms of trade, is this value is highly concentrated. Um, here in Europe, we've done some study on studies on the values of patents and their distribution, and you see that about 1% of the value of all patents is concentrated, sorry, 50% of the value of all patents is concentrated in the top 1% of all patents, which belong to a relatively small number of firms. And they tend to be the firms uh, in this S&P 500 sample. Um, so uh, there are issues about access to knowledge already in the market. Um, but let just come back to your question on where the battles being fought there, but they're being fought now in markets. So, um, as we saw in the early slide uh, on where the value is, and there's a big chunk of copyright, that's a big chunk of intangible assets which are covered by copyright in ways that, that people don't really understand. So, for example, large amounts of academic research are, are effectively covered by copyright. No, just go, go on to slide 10. Um, and we launched in the UK a review of the intellectual property framework. It was launched by the Prime Minister, and his question was whether or not the intellectual property framework uh, was well designed for innovation and growth. He asked a professor of digital economy to do the review rather than a lawyer. Uh, and his answer was uh, could it, the question could it be true that design, laws designed uh, basically in 1710? on copyright are today obstructing innovation and growth? The answer is yes. Um, and the, the reason for that is that certainly in Europe, less so in America, uh, in, I don't know so much about uh, some of the Asian economies, but I note that Singapore has recently adopted the, Amer the, the American model for copyright. But in Europe, we have a copyright system which tells you what you can do. Um, and what you can do is essentially based on models for the printing press. Um, and uh, whereas in the States, uh, they have a, a system called fair use, where as long as you're not competing with the original owner of content, uh, you can try it out and uh, be in court. And that has given enough flexibility in the copyright system to enable digital markets to develop. Um, the purpose of the, the copyright system, just along with the patent system, spelled out in the U.S. Constitution on the top of slide 11, and it's essentially to provide the incentives. Next slide, please. It's essentially to provide the incentives that promote science and creativity by limited uh, exclusive rights for authors and inventors. And the big challenge that we face is to make those incentives work effectively in digital market, not locking up material um, which 
could otherwise be used um, to by other by, by new innovators uh, to create new 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 content or to apply new content in new ways. So the key principles of the UK reforms are to, try, are to use the basic uh, principles of copyright, but to make markets work, uh, strengthening the key incentives for IP creation, and leaving room in the IP system for innovation and investment, which the fair use system gives in the, in the USA. And as I said earlier, I think Singapore have been in that place now for five years. They basically switched from the UK copyright uh, style system to the fair use model. Israel have just done it, and Australia are currently thinking about it. Um, and the idea is to create our, our principle, well, because we can't move to fair use because of the European framework, um, is to create the space within the European system for innovation, particularly by SMEs, by new enterprises. So the progress that we've made is on page 12. Um, we've already moved to set up a system for uh, the re reuse of works where you can't find the author, even if it's for you pride. Uh, our current copyright system locks up works whose authors are not findable, and that effectively uh, sterilizes a huge amount of uh, archive content. People like the BBC and uh, uh, national museums, as well as for a lot of private archives. And uh, then we're also looking at specific exceptions to copyright, which will provide the types of freedom which already exist in the US. And our objective is to implement all this in the course of the coming year. Uh, it's not straightforward. I mean, there are people who use the existing system who have relied on it and who extract, um, whose business model depends on the rents which uh, those give. Um, but we believe the change is essential to make innovation happen or we'll end up you know, making rents uh, on the stuff that we created in the 20th century and we are less likely to be there on the digital map of the 21st century in 10 years' time. So, uh, where we see the economic gains for the changes that we're proposing to make, set out on page 13, uh, the orphan works licensing system, which is already in place, uh, for example, in Canada and, and a number of other countries, uh, will free up content which is currently frozen, which was created by people who can't be found, and which could create uh, economic value if only people have the right to use it. The moment they don't and they can't get it. Um, text and data mining is one which our uh, research community has been particularly keen to do, particularly in the non-commercial sector. Um, I suspect many people in your audience would be familiar with the academic publishing model. Uh, if you write an academic article, the first thing you have to do is sign over your copyright to the publisher, uh, who will get it uh, for nothing. Uh, he also gets it reviewed for nothing by another academic and then sells it back to your university at a 40% markup on the cost. Um, then, if you want to text or data mine the articles that your university has subscribed to, uh, European system, you have to pay an additional license uh, to enable electronic copying because any type of uh, electronic transformation of the material is subject to an additional copying license. Um, we think that's unreasonable and that you should be able to text and data mine scholarly content that you have legitimately bought uh, in order to create new knowledge. Uh, given that there are one and a half million peer-reviewed articles published every year in the world, uh, it's text and data mining is the only way to do this. Uh, private copying exception is another thing that we're bringing in. Um, the moment in the UK, if you buy a piece of content, uh, you, you're effectively required to re-license it if you would transfer it to another medium. I see you're running out of time. Um, I'll quickly move on to the uh, slide 14, if I may. Um, we are also trying to set up efficient markets for intellectual property, and the particular uh, initiative which was suggested in our review was a UK copyright hub, which 
but I think would eventually be international, uh, in order to buy rights, in order to run businesses, um, in order to uh, just to be able to do it simply and quickly. And we're trying to do it on the basis of economic evidence, which is uh, nicely summarized on slide 15. Um, we're trying to collect as much data as we can uh, to set these uh, things in, in clear economic uh, context. Uh, right. This slide, uh, is this, this motto is diddled on the front of a building uh, in London. Um, and it, uh, it's the first ever experimental testing works which underpinned the first industrial revolution. Right. And it set the standards for uh, engineering uh, innovation around the world. Thank you, Tony. Can and finally, oh. finally, if I just say just in one, one word what we're trying to do, um, we have, we're in the process of issuing a report on how intellectual property rights ought to be better used in order to fund innovation. And we've, we're coming up with a series of uh, suggestions, some of which are based on uh, ideas which are coming out in Singapore and Korea, to allow IP to be used, particularly by smaller and medium enterprises, in order to get uh, access to finance for innovation for IP-rich businesses which have no other collateral. And that will require, exactly as Peter said, um, easier ways of get to going through the due diligence process. It will require uh, assurance and, and, uh, and guarantee systems, and it will require market which give value for IP, and most of these will be electronic. We set up, that we launched in the uh, UK this week, a market for design rights. Uh, the, you, there's a market for patent licenses, been launched in uh, Chicago about two, three months ago. These markets are coming, so as Peter said, the future is indeed now. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, the, the key thing, the markets that are occurring both in Hong Kong and London, technical standards to make this all happen. I heard identity. I heard this copyright reform uh, uh, occurring and also the issue of uh, tax and payments. So with that, I would just want to move, in fact, to open mic in the time. We have uh, about uh, half an hour left. Uh, open mic in terms of time. Can I just uh, uh, jump to – Jeanette, would you like to jump in? Actually, I did not plan to uh, comment uh, on those two presentations. Okay, um, so I will briefly add another perspective, uh, which uh, rather brings users' rights into the debate. My question where I come from is uh, what in the time of uh, digitized informational goods, what a new framework should look like uh, to not only serve creators and business interests, but also those of users. And I think that present modalities of trading and using information goods are in many ways deplorable. And the least one can probably say is that the current system implies a lot of underconsumption. The most obvious example for that is uh, existing digital goods that are for reasons because they are orphans, for example, unclear right holders uh, cannot be used um, or cannot uh, be put to new use. So many people have thought about how this problem can be solved and how uh, better access for the public can be gained. And one idea is indeed to create, and the Hargreaves report makes that clear, to create um, new frameworks for trading IP goods on a transnational level. At the moment, the whole licensing system that we have is more or less national, and that is for many people no good. We see movies being released in the US, but in Europe we cannot get them. And the problem is that users right now have every incentive to infringe copyright. And what a lawyer I know once said is that what law should actually do is keep prices down to a degree where it's cheaper to buy stuff than to illegal download it. So how can that be achieved? I personally don't believe in the idea of uh, reforming copyright. I think we have so much vested interest in the current distribution of property titles that it's better to try 
uh, achieve a better system by new licensing frameworks. And those licensing frameworks, I think, should not only take into account uh, business interests, but also those of users. A good example that we've seen is Google Books. Google Books, in many ways, was a step forward because it implied uh, licensing um, many books and not just single books. It offered a solution for orphan works by offering an opt-out solution, meaning people who do, did not want their works to be included had to opt out. That is the opposite system of what we have, at least in Europe right now. But the way users were treated in this framework was, from my perspective and also of those of the court, not acceptable because it clearly violated privacy uh, interests of users and uh, it created a new monopoly. So I think that new frameworks have to take into account uh, consumer interests by preserving their rights. Uh, it has to drive down prices and needs to introduce competition and thereby also weaken the veto position that many right holders right now have. So I think we need uh, transnational licensing platforms that drive prices down also by reducing transaction costs but they need to preserve, if I may finish my sentence, uh, consumer rights. Fantastic. But what about the existing framework? What about the existing system? I mean, these new licensing models. How do, I mean, what's the existing trade system, and how does that work? Any reactions, Nick, in terms of uh, Janet's comment? Um, well, I, uh, <laughs> I'll try and be brief, because uh, I'm a big fan of people in session speaking, but um, the, the, at the moment, the, the, the TRIPS, um, the discussions about intellectual property in, in, in the TRIPS context are really stuck because um, it, it, it's just not a very good environment. There are arguments over drugs, licensing of drugs, access to medicine. Um, at the moment, there is an, an agenda item on innovation and IP that was co-sponsored by the U.S. And, and Brazil to try and talk more about how innovation actually works with IP. It, it, just talk about it. Just explain. Um, so I, I think there's there's a lot of interest in the world trading community in 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 the internet in general. There's a willingness to admit they don't actually understand how the internet works terribly well, and um, that might be a place to start, is instead of saying, let's talk about IP and activating fixed positions and, and a, a really bad dynamic, uh, maybe go at it a different way and say, look, this is what people are doing. Mm -hmm. And here is some evidence that we could gather on what, what is actually happening. Um, the, other, the other side, the other reason for that too is, is I think whatever, you, whatever position you take on, on copyright and IP, um, it's certainly true that the U.S. is beginning the hearing process to consider changes to its system. Um, the European Union is uh, at the beginning stages of doing the same thing. As we've heard, individual EU members are changing their copyright systems now. And so changing that system at the international level will be impossible because those countries who are in the state, in the change process, will be unwilling to change their international obligations until they've settled on something. So. Um, I, I think this area is, is promising to study not from a law and, and IP perspective, but really more of what are people doing that is innovative in order to trade and what barriers do they face that are not even IP related, but that are commonly shared with other internet commerce because tax, taxation, um, customs, uh, barriers, technical barriers to trade affect are often agnostic as to what they, if they whether whether goods or not goods, and and so maybe using that as an opportunity to discuss, have to have trade the trade community understand the internet and how it works and how to facilitate it better, you would end up having the ability to then have a conversation once people have some confidence that the discussion is not some secret plan to to get them to agree to drug policies they don't want to, or something else, because there's, there's a great deal of sensitivity along that line. That I think that would be the way to have a, a, cons a needed 
constructive international conversation about trade online, really. Right. And so then again, that's going back to the, uh, the theme of building bridges, perhaps again, the trade community, the technical community, and then and, and this group. I mean, that was, again, at the beginning. Um, one way is to say, look, do we actually reform it or do we actually start again in a different way? One of the things that I think Peter mentioned was technical uh, standards um, uh, for, to enable internet public trading. And I think there's a session this morning which was the problem of actually routing money. So, uh, Manu, could you please talk about what, what the W3C is innovating in terms of this? Um, sure. So, um, uh, I'm the chair of the Web Payments Group, uh, as uh, was said previously. Um, currently, we, we, we've been talking quite a bit about you know, all of these things that we want to do, where we need to head with intellectual property trading, uh, the frameworks that need to exist uh, to, to do that, the legal frameworks that need to exist to do that. There's another part of this, which is what technical frameworks are we going to use. Um, and the, the core of, of the problem here is that, you know, in, in the 1980s and the 1990s, we spent uh, quite a bit of time um, figuring out how to communicate with one another, how to send an email halfway around the world. So you put in a person's email address, you hit send, and those, those bytes travel all the way around the world and get to the intended recipient within seconds. We never actually sat down and figured out how to send money in the same way over the Internet. Not once. We, we, we tried to do it in 1999, but we failed miserably. So the, the web payments group at the W3C, is uh, its, its core focus is to try and create a um, – try to build payments into the core of the web. Uh, and for those of you that are not familiar with the World Wide Web Consortium, we build the standards for the web. Uh, 2.4 billion people uh, use the standards that we create. Uh, every day, and so, and so the the focus here is uh, to take what we've been talking about here, and to build some actual internet protocols that that make it happen. Um, let me uh, jump through these uh, pretty quickly to hit some high points. Um, the W3C uh, is uh, looking at this problem as a a problem of financial freedom. Right. Uh, so just like we've kind of solved the digital, digital publishing freedom problem on the web, anyone can publish a, a website, anybody can send email, we can't do the same thing for money, we need to be able to do that. Um, we have a number of problems here. Uh, there's an infrastructure problem when we talk about money and equality in the world. Uh, 2.5 billion adults uh, don't have access to bank accounts. That's a big problem. Uh, the banks are not really interested in serving those customers because it costs a lot of money to onboard them. Um, the, the pinnacle of the payment technology that we use on the web today is backed by credit cards and bank transfers. This technology was built in the 1970s. It does not scale to the Internet. We need a new type of framework that, that can provide the banks some way of moving into the future. Um, there are, of course, regulatory issues with all of this that need to be solved. Um, and fundamentally, the, the, the problem with, with money on the web right now is that sending and receiving money is really it's, it's proprietary. Right, slow and secure, hostile to innovation, uh, and most of the big technology companies are built on top of this infrastructure. There, there is no real innovation. There's, they're all kind of modifications on the old uh, banking transfer uh, uh, credit card uh, uh, mechanism. So the question is, is there room to improve these services? Do we think that credit cards are the future? Right. Um, and, and more specifically, how do we reach the world's unbanked? Those 2.5 billion people, what technologies and uh, policies do we need to create to, to reach them? Um, so, like I said, there's a standard for sending email. There's no such standard for sending money. And that's what we're busy at the World Wide Web Consortium doing. We're creating that uh, global standard. Uh, for payments. The, the interesting thing about the W3C is, is everything is based on an open, patent, and royalty-free license, meaning that once we create this payment standard, um, any country can implement the standard, any small group can implement the standard and interoperate. They don't have to ask for permission to do it. It's one of the core tenets of the web. It's the, it's the reason the web works as well it, as it does, and we're extending that to uh, financial payments. The global financial network should be open, like the web, right? It's very proprietary now, um, and it was designed in the 1970s, so we need to, we need to change both of those things. Um, We've, we're building a number of things that I think people in this room would be very interested um, in, in uh, seeing happen with the payment system. For example, automatic tax revenue collection built 
into the standard at the, at the point of sale. You go to a website, you click the buy button, the money flows, and tax is automatically collected. You don't have to wait for your vendors uh, or, or your uh, citizens to file their taxes to, to collect those taxes. It happens in real time. We can track complex economic variables, um, you know, facts, not opinions. We can figure out exactly uh, uh, what money is being spent or, and, and which economic variables are being affected by the purchase. Identity is a big thing. Security is a, a big thing. We need to reduce fraud. There's $100 billion in fraud that happens a year, every year because we have this archaic system where we type in a credit card number into every single merchant's website that we want to uh, make a purchase on. Um, that's like a password into your bank account. It's a really backwards way of spending money on the web. There are better ways of doing it, and we're using those. Um, we need to be able to express products and transactions and contracts in a machine-readable, open way. Uh, if you go to a home improvement store and buy a hammer, you should be able to, in the digital receipt of the sale, see that uh, what the brand of the hammer was, see the weight of the hammer, see the warranty information associated with the hammer. All of it should be wrapped up into a digital contract, uh, sorry, a digital receipt stored at your bank or your preferred financial institution, and you should be able to then use that digital receipt to file your taxes if necessary. Right? This is the type of future that we're creating um, at the World Wide Web Consortium. This is not theoretical. We have implementations, and they work. If um, Payswarm is one of these implementations, uh, this is another one of the implementations. This is the Mozilla Firefox phone, and it has payments, open payments built into it, open identity built into it, and it's being sold in uh, emerging, emerging markets right now. So this isn't some kind of we wish we had this infrastructure. We do have this infrastructure, uh, and one of the reasons we're here at the IGF is to work with uh, policymakers, regulators, to make sure that this technology gets into uh, the world's um, unbanked populations. 2.5 billion adults, um, and this technology can certainly help uh, uh, all of them. Um, key here is um, this work is just starting. The technology is done, but we have uh, a workshop in Paris that's happening in February um, that we are uh, hopefully invite, we are inviting people from the IGF to come to and participate in the work. There's a lot of uh, regulatory policy stuff that needs to be done, and we need help uh, doing that. Um, if everything goes well, we will have a, an official working group um, pushing this stuff at the W3C next year, and we expect the first standard uh, to be done in 2017. Uh, we have backers uh, from with the likes of uh, Bloomberg, um, uh, uh, Mozilla, uh, Google is interested. Uh, there are a number of other key payment companies uh, that are interested in this work. Um, so, uh, so anyway, th that's what we're building. Um, if you'd like to know more, the, the slides are online. Uh, all of the orange links you can follow. Web Payments Group at the W3C. Uh, join. It's free uh, if you're interested in this work. Um, and if not, please come up and introduce yourself to me. I love talking about this stuff with folks. Okay. Um, I, I guess I failed completely in terms of time. <laughs> we have um, 15 minutes. We have an online question and a lot of online players. But uh, first of all, well, with your due respect, anyone here want to take? If not, can we move to the online question? No? Um, we have a question from Monica, who is a freelance journalist uh, based in Munich. And she, she'd like to ask the panel, um, how do the ideas for enabling IP trade and reform necessarily interact with traditional style bilateral and multilateral trade agreements where there seems to be a perpetuation of old systems? Well, let me, I mean, let me jump in. I mean, uh, as Nick said, this stuff is happening. And so it's a question of, I, I guess, uh, creating awareness for those in the other traditional trading communities to be aware of what is already occurring and to provide basically facts, not opinions. And so whether or not, I mean, if you're going to make an omelet, you're going to break some eggs. In other words, if you use the traditional metrics to innovate, you'll never innovate because, again, you know, the whole purpose of innovation is, in some sense, disruption. And so what are the new policy issues that would need to be resolved? The minute things, well, the reason why this is so difficult is because it crosses borders. And that means in some sense it's international. So, I mean, Jeanette, do you have a comment? Yeah. Um, I would like to comment um, uh, on where the two systems interact. 
I think the classical system in terms of licensing are certainly on the national level the collecting agencies. And I think in at least every European country there has been a call for a reform and uh, the European Union is also working on that to sort of internationalize the system because it doesn't make sense in the long run when you have global markets for IP to do the whole licensing business on a national level. There really has to happen something and the uh, collecting agencies so far behave rather, re I mean, they are rather reluctant in sort of internationalizing their system because they fear uh, competition uh, uh, with other collecting agencies. But I think where we can will see a lot of change is actually in licensing agreements between private partners. And I think setting technical standards is one way to set this uh, process in motion. When on the national level nothing is happening, then new initiatives have to start and do it first on the, on the technical level, but also on the organizational level. New uh, trading platforms for licensing can be set up even without the consent of national collecting agencies. The other thing I would say is um, I, I used to be a music manager for many years. I managed performers and uh, I actually negotiated contracts for exploitation of intellectual property, something I've come to learn is very rare of people working in multilateral institutions uh, in the government space on, on copyright policy, unfortunately. Um, I, I think the best way to end up with something more workable, because Jeanette is of course right, that, and there, but there are national examples of, of implementation of rights which don't assume the default is no to doing anything. I mean, right now that's the default in many countries is you can't do anything unless every rights holder says yes to you individually, often manually negotiating with you. But in Scandinavia, they, they, they do the opposite. The default is yes, mm -hmm. unless some rights holder opts out. And so the result of that is that's why in Europe you see streaming services first began in Scandinavia because that's the only place where you could do it. So um, I think that the, the, the answer really is to look at situations like that, put, bring those to policymakers and say, look, what, what is it you actually as a national priority want for your creative sectors in particular? And, and on the, the other side of it too is to recognize that the creative sector is very economically small. I mean, I say this as a person who loves music very much. It's very small. The whole revenue of the world's record labels is less than the amount made in one quarter by many internet, single internet companies. All record labels revenue is smaller, considerably smaller. And so I think there needs to be an awareness in the policymaking community of where is the value in IP. As, as the UK office made very clear, um, it's not where we spend most of our time talking. It's in places we spend most of our time not talking. And, and I don't think policymakers are aware of this at all, and, and should be. They, they, they really should ha you know, follow the money a little, really, with, with, with policymaking. And, and uh, you know, as I've argued before, I think you really have to oblige some rights holders to say, and say, look, it's nice that you have rights. But if, you have a, if you're a creative if you're a rights holder of creative works, you have an obligation too, which is to allow people to find you and let people license on reasonable terms. <laughs> not, be a, not, not keep what you own a secret and prevent anyone from knowing what you own and forcing them to negotiate, call you and negotiate a deal by phone with you for the same rights for every country. So I, I, I honestly think that, that, that copyright is not as broken on the internet in law as it's thought to be, but the, the implementation of it in particular areas of the creative sector is just no longer fit. It's not designed for an online world. It's designed for an offline world where you only sold physical copies of one or two variants, and that's it. Uh, and we just don't have that world anymore. Question. Norbert Bolos with Open Systems User Group. I'm very interested in this web payment stuff and my question is, where is the money in this? What are the businesses that are going to profit first and drive adoption? 
Um, yeah, very good question. There, there are a couple of uh, scenarios that could work out. Um, uh, we've, been, we've been talking a lot with international banks. The banks could use the protocol to interoperate with uh, each one another and allow people to buy things very easily over the web. You could see a huge drop in the percentage that, that you charge. Think of it as kind of a replacement for the uh, Visa and MasterCard for credit cards for buying things on the web. Uh, first, it could happen all online, then it could happen offline. So, so the banks could be one, one potential source of, of uh, people that adopt it. Uh, it's highly unlikely because they're very conservative, and they and I've I've had discussions with them where we where they've they've said this looks like it's 10 years down the road. Now you talk to the technology companies, and the technology companies say this looks like it's around one and a half, two years down the road, right? So we could see technology companies like um, people that would like to compete with PayPal or or uh, Google or Amazon uh, come in, agree on a consortium paying mechanism uh, for the web, and adopt it. Uh, in that way. Credit unions are another potential. There are companies that extend credit. There are many different types of organizations that could utilize the technology um, to greatly reduce the uh, amount of money that they pay on a, for example, per swipe basis on, on cards. Um, governments, small governments, uh, business to business are other places that could utilize the, uh, w the web payments technology as well. Can I just jump in here because, uh, I mean, I think the, the next one and a half billion that come on the internet, I mean, my personal view is that they're going to use the phone and the mobile network. So the question is, is the mobile phone company the new bank? Um, uh, can you give us an idea, Manu, of, of, of you know, the, the, I would think that the mobile phone market's pretty crowded already. You've got, you know, the two big players, uh, one in Asia and one in the States and, and one other, or well, two in the States. I mean, what, what, you know, you mentioned Firefox, the phone you had. I mean, how, how's that going? Um, so, so uh, for those that don't know, Mozilla, the creator of the Firefox web browser, have, have decided to get into the mobile phone business. Uh, and the reason that they got into it was because they felt that uh, the iPhone was threatening uh, the web, meaning um, closed application development was taking the hearts and minds of developers. So they built this phone to, to counter that. But at the same time, their strategy was very different. They decided to go after... Um, emerging nations they, they, and, and developing nations. They said, you know, people in the, in the States and, and Europe really care about, um, you know, they have their iPhones, they're happy, they're happy with paying $600 for a phone. This is a $50 phone, right? This is, this is going after the, or it's going to be a $50 phone uh, once it's sold on, on the market. Um, this is going after developing nations, and they, and they know that. They know that the developing nations that they're putting this phone into don't have um, the infrastructure, the banking infrastructure that the rest of the world does, or even if they do have it, um, it would be cheaper to run transactions over this mobile phone. So, so that, that's another constituency. That's another group uh, that, that uh, could, could make that happen. And the, and the mobile operators could then become the new banks, right? They're your new financial institution because they already have some kind of contract with you. They've, they've done some kind of know your customer with you. So everything, every, all the types of clearing that a bank does to give you uh, uh, access to uh, um, a checking account, the mobile phone operators could do when they give you uh, your phone. It okay. could even, even be subsidized so that these phones are giving, given away for free because you're running all your transactions over them. Okay, so I mean, I see a queue of uh, hands here. Can I just uh, go move, work across the room on the right hand side, on the left hand side first, please? Hi, thanks. Uh, Usman Ahmed with eBay Inc. PayPal. Um, I have a question specifically to the World Wide Web Consortium project, but also I think it relates to the broader discussion. Um, and that's specifically how uh, will you create standards that can meet the requirements of the various New Year customer regimes around the world. So they're very divergent, and we actually face a lot of problems with that in the methodologies by which you have to do New Year customer. So how would you create a standard that locks them all together or kind of binds them? And that relates to the broader question about what everybody was talking about, which is um, when you've got a, an, an IP good, a digital good moving across borders, and right now there's the WTO kind of digital customs uh, digital goods customs bar, so they're not subject to customs duties, but that may not last forever. And so you would have divergent customs regimes all around the world for, for digital products. So again, you know, it's the same issue, but in a different light. How do you deal with the various regulatory regimes that could exist uh, for, for payments, but also for, for digital goods more broadly? 
So I'll let the other panelists kind of approach the regulatory issue. Um, as far as uh, the technology, there are certain things that you should standardize and there are certain other things that you can't. Uh, when you look at uh, things like know your customer requirements uh, across the, the world, that is just something that is going to be very difficult to um, standardize, the way you do know your customer. What we can do, though, is provide a unified online identity that allows you to associate information such as government-issued ID number, whether you're over 18 or not, um, uh, your shipping address, things like that. We can build that, and we, and we are actually building that, and it's, it's built into the phone. So regulatory issues, these, everyone here would know better than I would. Okay, and that's the point of bridging different communities. We have a question online from Tony. Can you read out the question, please? Can you hear me? Yes. Tony, go ahead. What's your question? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, I know it wasn't a question. It was it was coming back on the discussion you've just been having about common standards for payment, and it seems to me that uh, the incentives to do this are so huge that there must be a way of aligning. I mean, the, the, the Ken Nakamura gives a really nice sort of account of you know just what the potential is for now two billion, boom three billion consumers on the internet to whom you can sell something tomorrow um, and it puts the whole copyright debate in, in you know, the cost of getting a piece of content to market has effectively fallen to zero and you can sell it to everybody on the internet um, and if you can get your message across extremely rapidly the incentives to do this are huge right and, and that's the amount of the, the and the, the question is, how do you get the people who own the channels and the people who own the payment systems and the people who, the, who organize the regulation to realize that value? Because it is enormous. Well, that's really the purpose of having these meetings, again, to bridge the different communities, mm. to make them even aware yeah. <laughs> that this is coming. I mean, again, the copyright, and Nick's point about sort of the, 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 in terms of relative scale and the numbers that you have provided, again, facts, not opinions. I mean, the, the technology is there, to, um, at least on the te technical front. What's not there is the policy coordination across the banking sector, the different um, concerns about identity. Perhaps there should be a minimum set, as Mary mentioned, a minimum requirement that you could look at that can at least get everyone moving in the right direction, experimenting, trying things out, with the understanding that we're going to break a few things. But the opportunity, again, the today's session is on opportunity. We had the session at the APRIGF on uh, basically the, 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 the downside and things that were already banned. The question is, how can we take this forward? And that really goes back to the next thing, which is, again, the WTO thing. It, and that's going to be back in Bali in December. So it will be very interesting to, to move to the last question that I think we have, uh, and then we can just uh, try to wrap up. Masanobu Kato, a friend of internet, <laughs> friend of internet and intellectual property. Um, my question uh, is actually the you know way of evaluation of inter uh, intangibles. Um, you know, when first uh, you know I heard about this uh, discussions, which is very interesting. Uh, you know, I was wondering if you are talking about e-commerce aspect of uh, tangible you know goods or general trade of intangibles. And assuming that the biggest challenge is e-commerce or the over the net transaction of intangibles. In the case of intangible, the biggest and one of the biggest you know, issue we have is how to evaluate intangibles. Say, for instance, in the case of uh, you know, patent protection of you know, some new ideas based on the great R&D you know, spending, many people have different uh, you know, you know, way of evaluating the value, and uh, people do, you know, cannot invest properly. So do you have any, you know, panelists have any good suggestion how we can have in a global, you know, system of a good evaluation of those intangible? Uh, I think if I understood uh, uh, Peter and Tony's approach in Hong Kong in terms of these uh, digital marketplaces, I mean, the question of, I think there's two things. There's a question of value and there's a question of price. And so the, the price, I think, markets can be a way of determining market price. But value, again, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, in Peter's slide, he has the three different, it's a whole ecosystem. There are lawyers involved, there are accountants involved. Uh, I think Tony's latest slides, which we'll all put on the internet, talks about how you can, again, look at banking on IP, which is looking at the professionals, professional investors, 
uh, and their views, professional people who are very who can see the value, not necessarily the price, because again, just like anything in terms of investment, uh, there are those who are perhaps ahead of the game. The question is, even if you did have that value, how can you make the transaction? How can you make the phone where you could just buy it and pay for it at the same time, in addition to keeping all the trade data and the payment data in such a way that you can track it? Do you know? Yeah, I'd like to come back to consumer rights here. Um, I've mentioned this before. I think this is particularly relevant with uh, regard to goods turning into services that changes the market relationship between seller and buyer in a, fundamental, in a fu fundamental way. We see this already now, people buying something on Amazon and suddenly it's gone because they've moved or Amazon has changed its, its uh, license politics, etc., etc. If we want to have a global trade system and that also involves consumer goods, we have to come up with general standards that give consumers certain rights no matter on what continent they live or buy stuff. In that, in, in that respect, if, in our paraphrase, are you saying we need to reform the international trade system in the digital age? Is that something? I think we need to not only think about companies making money and uh, creating profit, but also thinking about consumers. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, <laughs> Six, at 6 o'clock, let's uh, finish on time, minimally. Uh, last questions, if not, I thank uh, Peter, Tony for uh, tuning in virtually. Thank you for attending. Sorry about the overrun. Um, again, this is, uh, if there's further interest, uh, let's have the discussion. The slides and everything will be online. Thank you very much.